listening to From the Pink Seats Podcast of the State of Louisville Podcast Network. Now, here's your host, Jacob Lane, Matt McGavin, and Vince LaCoco. From the Pink Seats Podcast, we are back. Another week, fall camp rolling along here. The season approaching very quickly. It is football season, ladies and gentlemen. Jacob Lane. Vincent LaCoco, Matt McGavick. We've got a great episode tonight, our official predictions pod, fellas. And we're going to give our predictions and uh, be hilariously wrong like we are every year. I'm never wrong. <laughs> never wrong. So a lot to get into tonight on the show, and uh, we are very excited to talk about Louisville football because there's just a ton of things to really dive into. But first, just around the table here, gentlemen, how are we doing? Matt? It's great to have you on our show, man. You've been getting around more than a, than a broad downtown, buddy. Yeah, it's, it's been making the rounds on radio, but, you know, that's what happens when you're at all the fall camps. I mean, people want to know what they see. Yeah, that's right. And that's why you make it your priority every single week to go out and attend every single event all the time so that you know are in the know. You are the know, man. There is no being in the know when you are the know. Well, we are glad to have you on our show, my friend. Vince, how are you doing? I'm in your house, and we have no idea if what we're recording right now is actually going to work. It's going to work. Positive vibes only. Glad to be back in J-Town. <laughs> uh, Oldham <laughs> County. I've got that funk out of me now. Yeah, yeah. Ho- ho- hopefully, we can wash it off you soon and get you moved into J-Town. You know, whenever we close my door, though, Jacob, I just realized I still have the paint tape you on do. the side of my wall. Yeah, that you're, shows you how much I'm in this room. <laughs> you are a bachelor in a relationship, my friend. That, that is what you are. And he's uh, going to love listening back to this one. <laughs> I'm just saying, the way that uh, you, the tape on the wall, you got you got some room to go, my friend. But uh, hey, you are doing projects. I pay people to do stuff like that and go into uh, Ooh, insane amount of debt. Did you hear this guy, Matt? Well, did you hear him? Rich guy over here. He started talking about oh, that last part when I said that I'm going into an insane amount of debt. <laughs> so thank you. Let's hold, let's hold that rich thing. Uh, and, and definitely not true, but as I mentioned, Louisville football in the thick of things in fall camp, I think what we're on practice, uh, seven, eight, nine, something like that. Uh, they've meet- got six, they've got six in the books. We're recording this uh, Wednesday night. So they've got two more open practices for their second week of fall camp. And then they're going to go into their third week, uh, starting next week, obviously, but that's when that one is going to be closed to uh, fans and media. So, yeah. Yeah. And I would imagine um, and we're going to start getting into they're going to be doing like some of those scrimmages. And like you said, you know, behind closed doors time, time to actually put in some of the plays. I, I would imagine they've actually probably done the majority of that by now, but. Uh, I would, maybe they're going to do something that they don't want the world to see, uh, which is Matt, why since you've been to all the spring practices and they haven't put in any plays. What's it look like out there? It's just a bunch of bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we're going to, we're going to dive into all the bullshit uh, as I try to figure out what fall camp entails. Apparently I have no idea. I think they're out there just doing slip and slide. Yeah. And right. Running, <laughs> working on their back lips. <laughs> yeah. Dude, that's what's, that's what fall camp is. Right. I mean, you send your kids off to camp and they go, you know, they go down a slide and they, they play tag and they do all that stuff. So <laughs> no, some football happening, some actual hitting happening, Matt out here, just th- just putting all the team on blast by th- calling out their fights. Matt, how dare you? Oh, Report yeah, bre- breaking news. A fight happened in fall camp. Oh, like, stop the presses. Like, this has never happened in the history of football. Come on now. It's <laughs> just silly. It, that's how desperate people are for football, is that they start to say that people playing football is bad. Like, yeah. like playing against yeah. them. It's, time for a phone. So, it's funny because, like, all the Louisville fans are like, oh, yeah, it's actual competition in practice. And then all the Kentucky fans are like, oh, things aren't exactly going well. It's start the prom era. And then yeah. there's, like, a couple, like, there's a West Virginia and a Pitt fan they got involved. It, it was weird. No, I, yeah, whenever I, people started saying, like, you know, this is what we've been missing the past four years or whatever, I'm like, I'm like what? Yeah, <laughs> I'm like, I will... waste track this time for one, and people get hurt to three if you're fighting in a game, it's a penalty. That's a I good will point. Say and... my, uh, my favorite comment from that tweet is that, oh, wow, it looks like they're getting the Satterfield beat out of me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that one's good. That one's good. That one's good. It's it's that's, good. That's, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's how desperate people are at this point for football um, and it's so close that uh, we can finally do what we're going to do tonight and that's get predictions before we do all of that make sure that uh, if you're just tuning in for the first time and you have not subscribed 
subscribe to the show anywhere you get your podcast from uh, follow us on Twitter at pink seats pod. Uh, be sure of course, to check out the U of L report state of Louisville state of Louisville podcast network is who brings this show to you. Um, and let's dive into it. Now we got the predictions pod tonight uh, and I'm trying to work through tef- technical difficulties. Uh, my iPad with all of our topics. I connected loading. you to the Wi-Fi. You gave me the 2G. I need to get on the 5G, oh. which it looks like I might have gotten connected to the 5G now. 2G. Like, what are we oh stepping back into 2004 gosh. over here in J-Town? Uh, <laughs> at least I had Wi-Fi working in the garage, man. But we're, oh we're in gosh. here now. Uh, but let's do this. Let's start. Before we dive into some of the predictions, I want to start with Matt. And Matt, I know you've made your rounds and we're now getting your sloppy fifth and sixth. And we're <laughs> we're going to probably dive into stuff that you've already <laughs> talked about. but. Here's where I want to, I want to start, Matt. It, you've been at almost every practice. Um, I want you to kind of give us a breakdown of the big three or four players who have really stood out to you this fall camp so far. Uh, well, so far, one of the – I mean, you're going to have, like, the top guys that are going to stand out, like your Jamari Thrash, your Ashton Gelati, uh, Jar Jordan. Like, those guys – those are known commodities that – Louisville has on their roster heading into this season. So like, obviously you're going to expect some of those guys to stand out in camp. So, I mean, those guys like right off the bat, just like across the board in terms of like standing out. Yeah. Those three first come to mind. I mean, every, every practice I've been to, there have been moments where just Ashton Gelati looks like he's damn near unblockable. Like no matter who you put in front of him, he's just bull rushing right by them and getting in the backfield. Um, Jar Jordan, and he looks very comfortable transitioning to this scheme where it was more so predicated on outside zone runs, and now he's running a lot more in between the tackles, and he he looks very comfortable. He he actually looks like he might have added a bit of an extra gear. I mean, he's always been fast, but he he seems a little speedier, has a little bit more burst in this fall camp, which you know is very nice to see, especially with the right. The running game is not going to be as big of a fixture. So when they do run the ball, they're going to have to do it effectively. Uh, and Jamari Thrash, I mean, even with this this wide receiver core that's been completely overhauled and there's a plethora of guys on this roster now who you should have some fa- faith that they're going to get the job done. But, I mean, Jamari Thrash looks head and shoulders better than everyone. And one of the, some of the, one of the best one-on-one battles in fall camp that I've seen up to this point is when Thrash goes up against uh, Jarvis Brownlee, who I think has been a, st- a fall camp standout as well. He was someone to me that stood out in spring ball because it seemed like he's gotten a lot better when it came to playing tight on coverage, not letting his his wide receiver get away from him as much in man coverage. And Love it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, need it. And he he looks like he's done that. Not only has he done that. Um, Quincy Riley actually at one point in fall camp said that he's taking bits of his game and and, t- and taking it into his own. So Quincy Riley is more so known for his like his ability at covering, uh, dropping back into coverage and playing the pass that. And then Brownlee is more so like a physical jam you at the line of line of scrimmage type of DB. And he's Riley has been taking elements of Brownlee's game into his, which says a lot as to the steps that Brownlee has taken. That he's had other his own teammates take their like, bits of his game incorporated into theirs and another player that has stood out to me and it's gonna maybe perk your guys ears because it's at a position that Louisville needs a standout guy is TJ Quinn and I know Jacob I can already see on your face like I was on the TJ Quinn bandwagon for a while. but uh no he has looked very good he he has made numerous plays whether that's in in or around the line of scrimmage, making plays against the run, dropping back and playing against the pass, and he's actually looked very good sitting in zone coverage as a uh, as a bigger, more physical linebacker. You wouldn't think that would he, he would have the the zone coverage capabilities for a linebacker who is a little bit a little bit bigger, a little bit more muscular than everyone else on the roster. But he's looked really good, and of course, when he's playing the run like in the box he's he's looked phenomenal in that as well so yeah those are those are my five guys that i'd say would i would say has have stood out the most to me i've granted there's there's been a lot of other guys in camp who has done who've done well i mean the competition has been fierce in camp as you can imagine i mean there were three fights on tuesday alone (laughs) yeah no i mean they were just they weren't they were doing camp stuff man i mean right not doing plays they weren't, they weren't taking, <laughs> right, they were not right. doing football. Yes, right? we're, yeah. just, we're playing games and it's causing fights, but, but no, in all seriousness, that's great stuff. Um, and, and make sure if you haven't 
uh, and you're just now listening to football for the first time this summer and this heading into fall, make sure you check out all of Matt's practice notes on uh, the Louisville Report of Sports Illustrated because um, he really dives into detail about a lot of players. And I used to really love like the back before I got into covering football, I, I really always like enjoyed seeing the names that came out of fall camp. I mean, it felt like under Bobby, Charlie, there was always that one guy each year, one or two guys who stood out. Then you had those guys who kind of um, were under the radar. And it seems, and, and if, you, if you mentioned his name here, I apologize. But uh, another name that I've seen is Ramon Currier. Um, who was a defensive, an edge defensive end last year, really more of a, you know, a bigger defensive end in that Eastern, three, high. Four, Eastern high school. Yeah, um, probably got yeah. two of those guys now yeah. in the old football mm-hmm. program. Um, but Ramon, they're talking about, and I've seen Matt, you tweet about it. And I've seen other people tweet that he potentially is positioning himself um, in the likes with, with uh, Des Tell and Jared Dawson and Jermaine Lole to Thomas's Thomas's guys who can get in there and get some serious snaps at that nose tackle or defensive tackle spot. Oh yeah. I mean, the last couple of practices I've been to, uh, Perrier has been running primarily with the ones. Like it's, it's surprising. It's not been, uh, Jared Dawson who's been taking snaps at that nose tackle position next to, uh, Des Tell over at DT. It's actually been Ramon Perrier and he's, he's earned it. He's looked good in this, in the 11 on 11 periods. When I watch him in the position drills, he looks, uh, explosive, He's got a violent hit. He 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 has definitely earned his spot. And going back to the fall camp standouts, I don't know why I completely glazed over this guy because I wrote about him just a couple days ago. Um, is wide receiver Chris Bell? He mm. has looked really good. And on a wide in a wide receiver room that already has like plenty of options, he, and to say that he's been one of the bigger standouts is saying something because this is a guy who is six two and two twenty five. And when I watch him doing route running drills. He is running them about as crisp as some of the smaller, shiftier guys. And this is someone who has been taking some snaps at tight end in fall, or is going to be taking some snaps at fall in fall camp at some point. So like this, this is some this is someone who I could see be potentially an X factor on this offense because of that potential uh split role as a wide receiver tight end hybrid. And he just looks the part. He's He's caught balls in single coverage, made difficult contested catches up the sideline, done it in double coverage. He's he's looked really good, and I think he could have a breakout uh, campaign coming up. It's really interesting the kind of um, spot they're in with depth at wide receiver. We, you know, he's one of many standouts. I've heard a lot about Jaden Thompson, um, Kevin Coleman. Obviously, you mentioned Jamari Thrash. But the more, and we and I haven't, we didn't even mention Amari Huggins Brutes. You know, we there's so many names. Jimmy Calloway, you can keep going on and on about these. There are so many players at that wide receiver spot um, that it makes things easier for Jack. I mean, you and I yeah. joked about this, you know, after the interview with Drew. And, and you know, I, I was going back and forth with some fans who listened to the show about Drew and, and his opinion. It, it's interesting. Drew didn't go to Purdue. He's not a Purdue fan. It's just his opinion on the the, the stance. And it's wild to hear somebody say, is he just an expensive offensive coordinator? But you and I have gone back and forth and said, well, Drew, to be, you know, to be, you know, with all due respect, sir, uh, the talent on this roster is far too yeah. significant. And now look at the number of wef- weapons that Jack has. Yeah, I mean, just that one ball that the team posted on Twitter the other day in comparison to the ball Devin Leary threw. Yeah, Devin Leary sucks. I mean, in case terrible, just off that clip a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're winning three <laughs> games off that one clip three right there. Yeah. off that yeah. ball. Yeah, no, I mean, but I mean, back shoulder ball, a lot of zip on it. I mean, Coach Fitz has been clamoring for that for years. I've told y'all about that. I'm, it's a very hard ball, hard ball to guard in college football. And uh, I don't know, man. I'm excited to see Jawar in this different kind of role of catching the ball. Mm-hmm. You know, he highlighted that in the interview that we mm-hmm. had with him and mm-hmm. uh, splitting him out wide and how that's gonna, how that could potentially affect yeah. future draft stock with him. Do you uh, get to see Jaws at all out there, wide receiver, catching any passes? Did you see any of that out there about chance? I did, actually. There were actually a, a, a couple times where um, he went right – he did like a wheel route, and then there was one actually in the last practice that I went to in seven-on-sevens. I mean, he ran a route right up the seam and looked like a slot receiver. So, I mean – See, that's I mean, like one of the most that, – that's one of the hardest balls, like – if you run that route correctly and everybody else runs everything correctly kind of around you, I know that sounds stupid. Like if everything goes right, of course the play is going to go right. But if you can pull those safeties, you know, off their landmarks just a little bit, 
to get them to separate or, you know, in a cover three, you get a guy to pull that safety to pull a little bit more over the other way and you hit that seam. I mean, it's, it's beautiful. It's an easy touchdown or even in a man coverage, like a straight up man coverage, like the inside linebackers matched up on jaws. I like my chances on that all day. And it goes back to the, um, the interview that he had with us out at uh, Josh Megan's camp. I mean, he doesn't view himself as a traditional running back. He views himself as maybe more so a slot back, like a running back who can take a, lot, a fair amount of reps in the passing game. Yeah, I'm really interested to see, um, you know, we, we didn't see, and I, maybe we did, I, I can't really recall, but I'm interested to see what it looks like when they go empty, if they if they keep Jawar out there as a weapon or if it's, a you know, all wide receivers on deck type of deal. Um, it's those little formations, that, you know, just the nuances that I'm really excited to kind of see how Jeff Brown handles those. Well, Sat and I used to do that. Like we would put guys out there in that spot on outside the X or outside the Z receiver. But I mean, it didn't take a rocket scientist to go out there and figure that we we're playing 10 on 11 football. You, you didn't need to guard that guy. Right. Exactly. Well, let me let's move into this, Matt, and let's talk about storylines of, of fall camp and kind of how what they mean for the season. What are just one or two kind of big things that have emerged from camp that will either play a role in the season or um, will have ultimately an impact on what we see out there on the field? Oh, the first one that comes to mind for me is that the wide receiver uh, and defensive back battles in camp have been fierce. They've been intense. It's been some of the more intense uh, position battles in all of fall camp, and that's partially a product of how deep Louisville is at both of those respective positions. I mean, Louisville has, I think, seven scholarship newcomers at wide receiver, and I think four or five of them are transfers. And then Louisville – in the, in the secondary, they already had a fair amount of quality returners, and that's even with uh, Kittrell Clark heading to the NFL. I mean, you bring back Jarvis Brownlee, who, which, I mean, he was a little bit, he was not a little bit, he was very inconsistent last season. But I mean, when you look at his, <laughs> when you look at his statistical uh, profile, I mean, he was statistically one of Louisville's better defensive backs last season because he was, I think, tied for second in the ACC in pass breakups. And that's even with sometimes him getting just, absolutely roasted and toasted in coverage yeah and then there's Quincy Riley who I will still say should have gotten a lot more playing time last year than he did because he was basically like 1a on the depth chart between, between uh, behind control Clark and Brownlee and he still finished the season leading Louisville in, in interceptions with three and then you've got, got a guy like Trey Franklin and, and uh, Derek Edwards who they both have had their moments in fall camp you bring back both of your starting safeties in MJ Griffin and Josh Minkins. Minkins is coming off of his best season, and we got to see what he can do when he's actually healthy for an entire season. And and with MJ Griffin, I mean, you you can't deny like the how Louisville's defense got leaps and bounds better uh, when it came to not giving up the big play, and that how that coincided with Griffin sliding into the starting lineup. Yeah, and missed that's... tackles for that matter. I mean, Kendrick Duncan at one point was leading the country in missed tackles. I mean, yeah, cost. Yeah, space. Point, I mean, I, I wasn't trying to completely call him out, but you're not wrong. I mean, I'm not a big J guy like you. I'm just you know, I, I, I see it doesn't. I mean, it doesn't take somebody with 20/20 vision to go out there and see that somebody's missing tackles. You got to put somebody else in there. Yeah, yeah. and and then they they the, even with the, all those quality returners, they still brought in guys like. Storm Duck, who was an all ACC guy last year, Cameron Kelly, who's a, a quality safety at North Carolina. And then you've got more so long term depth pieces in um, Marquise Groves Killebrew and Marcus Washington Jr., who are both heading into their second year. So they're probably not going to get like a ton of reps, but they're both former five stars. So their, their, career, their ceiling for their careers is, is unquestionably high. So this, this is a unit that has a lot of depth and a lot of talent. And when you put that unit, against the wide receivers in camp, it produces a must-see rep in fall camp. Yeah, it's it's really interesting to the defense. You know, the depth has really rounded out under Jeff Brom um, and, and really kind of, as we talked about last week on the show, it's really, you know, they've gone out and added guys who can come in and start, guys who can play in the, you know, as depth pieces. They've added de developmental pieces. Um, and they've really not just sat and, and been status quo with what they had last year. They attacked the portal. They landed multiple guys who can come in. And knowing that there was a weakness there, 
um, in terms of, you know, the, the top corner leaving depth being gone and those safeties really needing help because of how much they were out on the field last year and what that impact did to them late in games. So it's going to be really interesting to see. Um, let me ask you about this, Matt, it, just to your blind eye, does it feel like the tackling is there? Because we talked again about this last week, right? As long as the tackling is there, this defense is fast. They are extremely speedy. They're not undersized, but they're big and athletic. Um, you've got guys who, who are, you know, kind of coming in into their own and their bodies and being able to play physical football a la TJ Quinn. But um, the tackling seems like it was such an issue the last couple of years. What did you kind of glean from what you saw the last couple of weeks with tackling? I mean, it, it certainly seems like it's there. Now, granted, this is camp and the preseason, so you're not going to have like a ton of periods where you're just going full blown, full contact, just tackle everything. So it, you kind of take it with a little bit of a grain of salt. But no, the, the tackling seemed to be very, there. Didn't seem like there were a lot of opportunities for missed tackles. I think the biggest indicator that the tackling is going to be much better is at, was actually the spring game when they were going full go the entire time. Because yeah. I remember towards the end of the game thinking, I haven't seen very many missed assignments when it comes to tackling. Like the, the tackling was sound. There are only a, a, maybe a handful of missed tackles. And, and that and then those could have been chalked up to like, okay, the other guy just simply made a play. And that, that's what happened. It's all exciting stuff. I mean, you want to see everybody shine and, and you know how it is in fall camp. The defense does good and everyone's wondering if the offense sucks and the, the <laughs> offense does good and everybody wants it's to my know. my favorite part. Yeah, everybody <laughs> wants to know if the defense sucks. So it's going to be really interesting to kind of see when the season actually yeah, takes I would, place. I would always find myself sitting there like in either as a player or whenever I was on staff like, man, are we like, are we any good? Because <laughs> like, <laughs> you don't, I mean, like 2018, you got, I mean, I, I feel like every player on that team will be honest with you and look back at it now and be like, all right, look at it. Like, we knew we weren't going to be any good that year. But 19, 20, 21, I mean, I guarantee you, like, I went into all those fall camps at the end, and I'm like, I, I just I just don't know. We need to play somebody. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it's um... – you know, it's it's been an interesting summer and off season leading into fall camp, and it's kind of it, I don't want to say that there's been no excitement or anything you know may, major happen because they, I don't think you want that to happen in fall camp. You know, like an injury or you know just somebody gets in trouble or something, something happening. But it just seems like it's been handling their business. You know, listening to the coaches speak, I don't feel like you know, and I don't think the Satterfield coaching staff really ever said much, but I just don't feel like we're hearing anything that's outside of, like I said, Jeff Brom playing the opposite of Mad Libs, which is, it was good. We're great. We're going to have fun. We're gonna have fun. We're gonna play football. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's just really interesting to see them go about their business a different way. All right, let's take a, a quick break here. We'll step away. And when we come back on the other side, we're going to dive into predictions, um, the schedule. We're going to look at leading us uh, statistics like we did last year, uh, and then just kind of walk through some of our bold prediction and ultimately what you, uh, May, what, what we're coming from at least heading into the season obviously things will change as we get going but we'll be right back stick around on the other side all right predictions time fellas this is when we make ourselves so we volunteer to make ourselves look like idiots like that's just what it what? is uh, see yeah, at, no, at least my at least my prediction is already in writing <laughs> yes that's right that's right but yeah the, the thing you is, is put we, all my predictions in sharpie right now they're hitting bet the house bet your mortgage bet whatever I feel like we're almost like a record of ourselves from last offseason heading into the Syracuse game of just uber confident. We feel great, blah, 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 blah. And then we got a little bit of a reality <laughs> check. So let's hope this year things are a little bit different. But let's just dive into this and start with the schedule. And um, we really have not talked about the schedule really at all. I mean, we've, we've, got, we've dove into, you know, some of the highlights of, you know, a Kentucky and how important it is to get the rivalry back in the right spot. And, um, you hear the coaches saying the right things about that. We obviously know the implications of that October 7th game against Notre Dame um, in week, what is that, week six of the season where Louisville could potentially be sitting at maybe 5-0 and if things kind of go the way that they, they go. I mean, uh, we've seen, just to kind of recap the offseason, we've seen a lot of chatter about this being the weakest schedule in the ACC, one of the weakest schedules in the entire country, really, because of the fact that Louisville is not going to play Florida State and Clemson, who are two of the top teams, 
not only in the conference, but in the country. Um, and they've also got some other opponents that are on their schedule that they're used to seeing uh, year in and year out, or, or at least, um, you know, consistently. But this schedule has some, some interesting kind of dynamics to it. You have two neutral field games early. You've got a couple of key away games and you're looking at just a schedule where you're never, I mean, you're at home for a couple of weeks in, in October and early November, but it's you have in and out, three, you know? three true road games and that's it. Yeah. And, and it's all of these things that we've talked about being the perfect combination for Jeff Brown coming in and winning. And so fellas, Matt, I'll start with you because you have yours in writing. Take me through, you don't have to go game by game, but just kind of give me the highlights of where you think Louisville's going to shake out at the end of the season. And then what is the game that you feel like maybe the most confident in, and, and maybe outside of Murray State, obviously, but the most confident in, maybe it's a big game. Uh, and then what game do you see as the slip up for Louisville? Because we know one thing about Jeff Brom, and this isn't me being negative. This is me just telling you the numbers say that each year he drops a game that he should not lose. We've seen it against Rutgers. We've seen it against Northwestern. We've seen it against Illinois. We've seen it against teams in the Big Ten that they were simply better than. So, Matt, take me through what you've got on the schedule. So, I'll just get this out of the way now. I don't think they're going to go 12-0. Sorry, Vince. I don't think they're going 12-0 either. Don't worry. I've got some losses in here, Matt. Don't worry. Okay, okay. It's just okay, not to your just... homers of BC or freaking Duke. I guarantee you I'm going to look at your predictions, and you're going to have Duke beating us. I actually don't. I have it being a close game, but I don't I have no. been winning the game. But anyways, <laughs> but yeah, this this is overall an easy schedule. Like in the grand scheme of the ACC, it's it is one of, if not the easiest. But I mean, there are when you, when you break it down, there are a handful of teams which, you know, will give Louisville some competition. I mean, at NC State, NC State, as we talked, what was it, a year, two years ago when we talked to John Garcia, he said the two most underrated atmospheres in the ACC are Louisville and NC State. I mean, at NC State, it's not going to be easy, especially with Brandon Armstrong and Robert and I there. At Pitt, I mean, when, I mean, Narduzzi's a good coach, even though they, they did lose a lot of talent. Um, but, yeah, but anyways, I am predicting that Louisville this season goes 8-4 and four and 6-2 and two in the Atlantic Coast Conference. Now, right out the gates, they're going to go 4-0. I mean, at least I think so. I mean, Mer they open up. Down at Georgia Tech, I mean, it seems like they have the right guy in Brent Key, considering what he was able to do after they finally shit-canned uh, Jeff Collins. But, I mean, the, the cut bird is still relatively bare with Georgia Tech. I mean, they have a handful of guys, but not a ton. So, Louisville should win that. Murray State should be a easily four, four or five touchdown blowout. No question. Indiana, they lost a lot of talent on defense, and they even still were four and eight last year, I believe they were. So that should be an easy win. Uh, Boston College, like they they've got a good defense, but I'm not. I still need to see like how much their offensive line is going to be because they had quite literally maybe the worst offensive line in all of FBS football last year. So I mean, I think it's going to be a low scoring game against Boston College, but it should be a win. I think their first slip up is going to be, like I said earlier, at NC State. Like I said, in rally, uh, and then Brennan Armstrong is reunited with Robert and I, and we saw what they did to Louisville in 2021. So I think that's going to be a loss. Different team. Um, totally different team. Uh, sure, yeah. It, it's, it's Virginia with a better defense. Sorry. Um, <laughs> and then the next week, Notre Dame. I mean, that's going to be a huge game. If they do open up 5-0, I mean, you could, you could realistically make the case that college game day is going to be at this game. It'll be a huge game. But then again – I mean, Notre Dame is top 15 starting out the season for a reason. They're a really good team. They've got finally a, a decent quarterback in Sam Hartman. Uh, their ground game is really good. E even though they lost Logan Diggs to LSU, they still have another 1,000-yard running back on their roster. Yeah, which is, is wild. They had 2,000-yard rushers last season. It, and the, the only thing about Notre Dame is that their re receiving core isn't really that great. I mean, their defense is still top 25 good, that's for sure. I, so I, I have them losing, not getting blown out, but I think Notre Dame should cover in this game. Should. At least that's what I think. And then <laughs> they go on the road to Pitt next um, the week after that. They lose a lot of talent, especially on that defense. But I have them winning that game because I think uh, who they have at quarterback is an upgrade over Kadon Slovis because I was never sold on him. I 
And Vince knows as well as everyone here that I'm really high on Phil Jerkovich. Yes, yes. Yeah, <laughs> everyone knows, man. We all know. Yeah, and then even still, even still, their, their, wide rece- their wide receiver two and running back two from last season are still really good. So now they're going to be the main guys. And even though Pitt loses, I think, five of their seven defenders that were voted all ACC last year, I mean, Pat Arduzzi is still a really good defensive coach. So he always seems to get the defense rolling. And since it's on the road, I have them losing that game. So for those tracking at home, I have them losing three in a row. So that's that's not really a great stretch for Louisville. My trap game on this entire schedule, and Vince is going to hate that I'm going to say this, is Duke after a bye week. Because Duke, yes, no, I know Vince. Okay. You, you, no shot. You, you don't want to admit it, but Duke is good. They have. They are good. A, they, they have. Yes. Yeah. Lacrosse. All right. Let me just address Vince here for a second. You, Duke has had a top position player in every single one of the top ACC rankings from the, from Eric McLean and the, the, the podcast that he does with Kelly Grimwich. And I know you're saying, well, that's just one person, but Eric is the, the we're going to have this conversation with Eric in a few weeks and we're going to make Eric at least have Vince consider just for a split second. But I agree with you though, Vince, like it, the bye week is why I feel confident that Louisville wins that game. You have a full week to prepare for them. I, I think they win this game, but it, I, I think my official prediction was like a one point win because yeah, they, lose, it's gonna be a good they, they they bring back almost literally almost every yard of their offensive like continuity from last season and and their defense they, they lost a couple guys sure but i mean they still have some guys on that on that side of the ball and especially in all these preseason all acc tackle Dwayne carter he's pretty good and then the next two games are against virginia tech and virginia those two should be like two of the three maybe two of the four worst teams in the entire acc like those teams are not good. I mean, Virginia Tech was bad, and Virginia was worse. Vir- That's true. Virginia, but that Virginia, Virginia game, that Virginia game is interesting because of the five day turnaround. You have a very quick turn after playing Duke, Virginia Tech, in back to back weeks. It's just that's yeah, a game Virginia. where if you're talking about Jeff Brom. Those little like those. That's a game I watch because it's like yeah. that is just slipped in there waiting for Louisville to slip up on. I'm but though I'm not concerned because like Virginia is so bad that I think I wouldn't be shocked if they can Tony Elliott after this year. They're that bad. Yeah, and then, I know. And I, I don't I'm not saying that Virginia is by any means better than Louisville, but simply just looking at how things have shaken out over the years of teams that yours should walk in and have no problem with. That's a game just because of the quick turn that I just you just never know. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And then after and after the two Virginia schools, they go on the road for their last of their three true road games of the season at Miami. And Miami's got a borderline top 25 squad, but I have Louisville winning this game because since like the mid 2000s, Miami has followed the same damn script, generate a <laughs> shitload of hype in the off season, bring in a bunch of players, have tout this new coaching staff, and then they fail spectacularly to deliver upon these preseason expectations they've done it for a decade and a half now and they sure as shit did in the first year of the mario cristobal era now i say all that to say miami definitely has gotten better this offseason i think they had the number nine transfer portal class in all of college football and that's taking into account both transfers in and out and, and tyler van dyke is good and they yeah, tyler harrell they, too that's right they, they do have tyler harrell and they find, they got rid of gaddis they brought in um Shannon Dawson from Houston to be their offensive coordinator. So we'll see if that actually makes them better on that side of the ball. And then they did address their some portal. They did address their offensive line needs through the portal. And on defense, they've got dudes all over the place. They might have the they might have the best safety duo in the ACC because Cam Kitchens is a monster. He's really good. But I don't think Miami has enough offensive weapons at this point in time to to really they put them over the edge and be considered like one of the more elite teams in the ACC. And plus we, we all know Miami has no home field advantage. They play in an NFL stadium and fans don't give a damn. They never go. So <laughs> unless they're good, unless they're good, unless they're good. The you just so, never know at the end of the season. All right. Yeah, and did so. you pick Kentucky? What do we have there to, to cap it off? Yeah. I mean, Devin, if, if Devin Leary can stay healthy and Lord knows he's had his injury concerns and he has that porous offensive line to stand behind, but I mean, UK brings back their top three receivers from last year the, yeah, they lost a couple of pieces on defense, but they still bring back like most of their top tacklers. I can I don't have the exact number for me, but they bring back a lot of their production on defense. I mean, I'm, 
I know a lot of people were mad at me <laughs> for choosing UK to to win to beat Louisville in year one of the Braum era. But I, at this point, I'm firmly in all believe it when I see it mode, just because of the recent history and because it's not like UK is going to be dog shit. They're going to have a good team. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right, Vince, you don't have to go game by game. Matt did that for you, as we warned him not to do before he did that. <laughs> Vince, give us You're just welcome. your highlights. <laughs> Where's Matt wrong? Where are you right? Where are the differences? Where do you see Louisville shaking out? Okay, so I'm going win Tech, win Murray, win IU, win BC. I'm going – they're dropping NC State. I say we pull off the upset against Notre Dame because that is at home, and I'm not sold on Marcus Freeman as a college football coach, (laughs) as a a head coach. He's a handsome fellow, though. He is hands down one of the best-looking coaches in college football, but he might not be a head coach. Rooting for him, though. Uh, What did I say? Uh, We are going to drop pit. Uh, Hopefully we beat the bye. Uh, Duke is going to be an ass-kicking. Uh, we're going to beat Virginia Tech. Uh, I have us dropping to UVA. I'm with Matt. I think that could be a trap game for Louisville, and it just screams. Jake, no, Jacob said J- Jacob 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 Virginia one of you is a trap game. One of you no, Virginia but, is horrible. I don't think they're going to have any problem I, with that I just think, <laughs> look, the quick turnaround and with them coming in – I don't, it's just one of those games. I just don't. I've never felt good about Virginia. It goes back to Seth Dawkins and him may having to get put in on defense and making a play late in the game in the rain. Like I guarantee you, that's going to be a bad weather game. Some like we're not going to be able to complete a pass. It's like it's going to be one of those games where something is not. Go, it's nothing's going to go right for us unless you put Brock Elman in. Shut up, and then it'll be Brock Tober, baby. All right. Well, I'm dropping. I'm dropping Miami. And I'm going to say that Jeff Brown pulls one off against Kentucky at the half. We can end the segment right there. I have the exact same schedule. So we don't need to die. Really? Really uh, <laughs> exact same game, pick the exact same way. My thing is, uh, I agree, Notre Dame. I just think Louisville knows how to play Sam Hartman. Like, I just – I think that that's going to be an opportunity for them. And I'm not saying he's going to come in here and do what he did last year. I think we all know that's very That'd unlikely. Unless Presley Myers so. sprinting up 222, <laughs> high-fiving everybody and getting everyone riled up again. But uh, I think that NC State, man, I, I just have PTSD with Robert and I. Like, I just – I do almost to the point where, like, when the head coaching job opens, I'm like – quietly like hey like maybe the old man gets a a gig here uh but no i mean he's a great offensive coordinator and what what he and brennan armstrong did at virginia was no fluke when you look at what happened last year when he's gone and the impact that 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 had on brennan armstrong and then the impact that that had on garrett schrager at syracuse so you're talking about that team that's a game on the road that's a rocking environment they have a dynamic defense yeah that and that's a friday night game you know that place is going to be rocking right right that'd be a fun game to go to like straight up, that would be an it's incredible insane. road trip game to go to. I've never been, no, I've never been there. Yeah, that'd it's, be a great it's game. It's beautiful. Like whenever you really? drive up, it's like surrounded by trees and stuff like that. And uh, I don't know, man. We whenever we played there in nineteen, I think that was the game to get bowl eligible. So like the vibes just felt good. It was, was like, yep. It was it an was. eight o'clock kickoff game. And it's one of those where you're like, oh yeah, this is the one right here. That's, and they were not good that season, if I'm not mistaken. And I remember it was still a dog fight. No, no, I'm not saying that in any way. I just that was not like I remember that game. It, I think didn't didn't Louisville run all over them? Like was that not a game where JV and Hawks in the second half they did, yeah. Yeah, I, I remember that game kind of standing out. It was with a that, common but, theme that year. Yes, exactly. <laughs> right, exactly. And so I think it's just really interesting where the schedule shakes out. I mean, I think they go into that Notre Dame game four and, and four and one. Um, you know what? What? What is it about Pitt? It's on the road. Louisville has struggled on the road at Pitt. Go back. I know twenty twenty that no one was there except for the rats and you know under the concourse Can't type of situation. Um, you know, Vince could drop yeah, it and. And the I one time that Pitt – I did get really... Primanti Bros, and that was awesome. See, I don't so know man. if y'all have ever been there. No. Yeah, when I went to the Pitt game in 21, I got Primanti Brothers. But, yeah, yeah, I mean, really the only time that Pitt hasn't had, like, a at least a good or great defense was, ironically, the Kenny Pickett year, the, his final year, because their defense was like, eh. And they still won the ACC because of them. <laughs> it must be nice to be able to win the ACC with a bad defense and the quarterback with two gloves. 
Um, And it's interesting, uh, speaking of Kenny Pickett, I mean, not to derail the conversation, we're going to get into this, but I I saw your tweet, Matt, that you believe that Jack Plummer could follow in a very similar footstep to Kenny Pickett. No, I said that would be a bold prediction, and we can see that as a segue. (laughs) Now we're pulling group chat messages out on the podcast. Okay. Yeah, that that wasn't even a tweet either. That was straight from the group DM, you fucker. (laughs) Was that a group message? That was a group message. When, when you grind it, work it works as hard Twitter. as I do, you don't, you can't differentiate. Yeah. You just, you know, when you're dropping your daughter off in the morning at kindergarten and then you're going into the office and you're in meetings all day, Matt, I'm sorry for better. dragging I'll, you I'll do you one it. better. I just, think just me- that, I think that Jack could have a Joe Burrow year. There, I did you one better. Feel better? There you go. Feel good? That's, that's right. Well, that's a, a lot of people step, just roll their eyes. I also said it, we could beat Ole Miss. You think they didn't roll their eyes, man, when I said that? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> If you haven't Ole rolled your eyes in my prediction <laughs> by now, then you are sort yeah, of mistaken. That's right. what I said. At least you can embrace it. That's right. <laughs> okay, let's do this. Let's jump in now. We're looking at the schedule. Let's look at the team leaders, and then we'll close the show out on the bowl predictions, which I just accidentally spoiled Matt's. But, uh, you know, hey, Matt's been on the radio 18 times. You've probably heard it by now. Uh, let's start. I think we all agree <laughs> that unless there's an injury – uh, unless, I mean, I guess you could go back to the two years where Jack Plummer was in and out of the lineup, but it just seems that he is the guy. There is going to be no movement there. Sure, maybe Brady Allen plays a little bit. Maybe Brock Doman plays a little bit. Maybe Pierce Clarkson plays That's a little bit. That's who I want to see. It's, you know, I want to see – you have four games to not burn his red shirt. We have Murray that, you know, is a 100%. You should be able to get a guy like that in and get good, valuable reps. That could mean something. Yeah. Yeah. So and I, I will mean, say this. And I will say this ahead. before we go into the leaders part. Yeah. Jack Plummer is clearly the guy. Brock Doman, he's he's looked comfortable and, and looked good in the system and, and in fall camp. And as far as QB3 goes, I, as far as at this point, it's Pierce Clarkson. Unless I, unless something happens over the next like week and a half of fall camp, um, I think it's going to be Pierce Clarkson because Pierce has impressed me with his, uh, with his, what am I trying to say? His, his small hands. Yeah, his, yeah, his, his big hands. Yeah, definitely. No, his, um, his, his great hair. With, with how? Shut up. With how decisive he is. Because one of the, one of my main complaints the last couple seasons with Malik Cunningham is that he seemed very indecisive and hesitant with some of his throws. Granted, this is fall camp, but he has looked really snappy and decisive with his decisions. Like when he finds someone to throw it to. He he looks confident when he does it, and not only that, he's got he's delivered more often than not a really accurate ball. And his as far as his arm goes, it's actually looks like he's gotten he's developed a little bit of arm strength from what we saw um, in high school. And arguably, the most shocking development of fall camp is that Brady Allen has not looked good, not looked good at all. And he's the one that actually has not only a year of college experience, but a year of experience in the system. Granted, he, he I think, played four and took a red shirt, or maybe it wasn't even that much. But still, that's an entire year of having a, a knowledge of the system. And I mentioned how Pierce Clarkson, Clarkson looks confident and decisive. Brady Allen did not look like that hardly at all in the first six practices. And I, I say this kind of tongue-in-cheek, but – I wouldn't be shocked if most of the interceptions thrown in the 11 on 11 period have come from Brady Allen. Damn, Matt. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. It I'm kidding. could be, you never good, know. Good, good I mean, analysis. Stuff like that happens all the time. Uh, I mean, especially when a new coach comes in, uh, the big thing people love to say is like all positions are up for grabs now, which like, you know, some are, some aren't like we obviously brought in a transfer starting quarterback for a reason to be, you know, the guy, uh, but some guys just the pressure and you know the competition. Sometimes iron doesn't sharpen iron, <laughs> you know. It, sometimes it just doesn't work out that way. I mean, I hope I hope eventually he can turn it around. And I mean, worst case scenario, we will. got Damon Pierce down there dialing it up on scout team this year. <laughs> that, that's that's an underrated type of thing. No, not at all, man. I mean, we, we when Puma was back there at scout team, like everybody loved to give Puma shit with like for how we threw her and stuff like that. But imagine a Des Fitzpatrick where all you got to do is show him a card with a line to run and, like, tell Puma to be like, hey, take three steps and throw it here. Like, the plays were getting made. The plays were getting made. 
yeah. That, you know, as you mentioned, that iron sharpens iron and, you know, that's going to ultimately make them better. Um, so passer, I think we agree it's Jack Plummer. And I have rusher on here, but I mean, I think with it's Jaws. I guess the question is, is it a thousand yard rusher? I have him at 875. I just I, don't see him being able to get over a thousand. I don't think he's going to go over a thousand. And not only is it because this isn't a run heavy system anymore, but the last uh, few practices I've seen in fall camp, they've been rotating those running backs. Yes. Yeah. And that's Frequently. exactly my like thought. Maurice process. Turner has gotten a lot of run. Isaac's gotten his fair share of run. Uh, Kiwan Brown has gotten involved at points. Even, um, I think this is how you pronounce his name. I apologize in advance. Mario Agin, this, this the, walk-on. The famous actor. Back. Yeah. Not an actor. I mean, he's a little Vince. Way to step all over the joke. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Thank you. Thank you. He, I, I mean, he could, he could be, he could be this, this season's Maurice Berkeley. I mean, Seriously. Yeah, like there's interesting. Yeah. There are they plenty of running backs in that running back room who deserve who look like they deserve reps for the season. So I don't think Jaws is going to be a thousand yard rusher. Now I think he's going to be very efficient. Could he could he be someone who averages four and a half, maybe five yards a carry? I can see it. I'm gonna have him for over a thousand. That's it. And my thought process thought process behind it is based off last year and how much how many yards uh Jeff had with just, I mean, not hitting on walk-ons was one myself, but having a walk-on running back. I mean, yeah. having a guy like Jawar and even Mo Turner, like, I, I, you can say Jack, say we're in a world where Jack isn't this great passer and thing, like it's just fall camp clips and, you know, he's just a good quarterback. He's your Will Gardner or your Will Stein, you know, not bad, not great. You're just your game games. manager. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So you have to find – the guy to give the ball to. You have to be the stud. You have to get your best player the ball. And in that situation, the easiest way to get the best player the ball is turn around and hand that ball off to him. And I think Jeff could utilize that a little bit more than people are going to give it or giving him credit for now in the preseason. I think he's going to rely not heavy on jaws, but like 100% keep it a balanced offense. Mm-hmm more than people think. Yeah. And it's, you know, we talked a little bit about this a couple of weeks ago, but when Sat came in in 2019, right, we all thought it was going to be Hassan Hall and they were going to run the ball all the time. And of course they did run the ball all the time. That's what they did. But that season in particular stood out because Sat took advantage of the personnel that he had left over. And that was the wide receivers and Dez, Marshawn at tight end, and then um, Tutu <laughs> Atwell, right? So this season it's similar with the running back position. I mean, obviously, Jawar Jordan and Mo Turner are really talented guys that are holdovers. You bring in, you mentioned it, you know, not enough people are talking about Isaac Gariendo. Um, so it's really interesting there. Great, great kind of analysis on that. I really like the prediction of a thousand like yards. That. I think it's it's not a bold take. I just don't, I, I think it's just gonna be no, a lot of interesting. I mean, you can make an argument for for it to go either way. I'm really excited. I'll hit it real quick, is to see Mo Turner in that slot. Uh, receiver position split out wide because he is, let's not forget, a guy that beat Tyreek Hill in a foot race. That's right. Up 10 pounds this season, too. I saw on the roster. Okay. So. Is, I, I have to say this real quick. So, the very first uh, rep during 11 on 11s on Tuesday's practice, I mean, Maurice went straight up the middle through the offensive line and just flew by everyone. And when he was like five, 10 yards away from the end zone, he threw up the piece. <laughs> ah. Beautiful. See, I mean, look. That's the kind of swag I need. I don't even get to go to practice. I don't know some shit like that. That's incredible. All right, let's talk about I think, again, here, we're probably all on the same boat, knowing what we know about Jeff Grom's offense, that Jamari Thrash is going to have a high number of targets. I think what fans need to get prepared for is the shift in volume. We have not been used to a guy catching – I mean, shit, I don't know how many catches the leading receiver has had the last couple of years, but it's probably not been more than 40, 30, 40, 50 – uh, last year, their leading receiver, I believe, was in the at Purdue. Charlie Jones was in the 80 – or no, he had 100 and I think 19 catches maybe mm-hmm. or something like that. Yeah, it was, it was over 100, that's for sure. Yeah, and, and, and years past, they've had similar situations with Rondell Moore and with Brick Bell where they really throw that receiver the ball a lot. But again, we talked yeah. about this a little bit earlier. What, go ahead. Uh, Tyler Hudson was Louisville's leading receiver at 69. And Charlie nice. Jones last season, he had – Dun, da, 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 110 receptions. There's a little bit of a difference there. Jeez. But we talked about this, you know, and, and it's really interesting, Matt, with, you know, the dynamics of going from Malik to, to Jack Plummer. Not that it's one quarterback is better than the other or whatever. They're both really talented guys in their own right. But the difference is that we're going to see the ball thrown away. We're going to see, you know, the check downs. We're going to see these different things that I think fans 
are not necessarily thinking about that's going to change so much how the experience of how much fun this offense can be when they're just slinging the football around. And that's because that's what fans want, right? Like, I know, Vince, you like to break knees and you like oh, to, you know, eat the chicken bones the off of the, the chicken wing. And, you you know, you're just a true football man who likes violence and who likes defense <laughs> and running the ball and pounding the football. The I am an offensive guy. I like to score points. That's true. But I mean, point being is just that we're going to throw the ball a lot. And that's yeah. fun. You know, it's going to be a, a lot of a, a big switch here. But Jamari Thrash, what do we think yardage? Yeah, what don't, do you all think? <laughs> that's right. That's true. You could throw the ball into the ground. I mean, we're not necessarily for sure that it's going to be that way. But Matt, what do you think in terms of yardage for Jamar? I mean, in catches, catch uh, yardage. I I can see him being a thousand yard receiver. Maybe maybe even eleven hundred yards. I don't think he's going to come close to Charlie Jones. It's thirteen hundred, just because I think there's a lot more options for Louisville in this offense than what Purdue had. Not to say that Purdue didn't have options because they, they did have some some solid guys. But I think. I think Jamari can have like an 85 catch, 1100 yard season for sure. Yeah, I, I'm right there with you, man. I'm not going to get too much into it. I don't want to give away my bold prediction, but I'm I'm right there with you. Thousand yards, uh, big season, lots of catches. Anything you want to add to it? I would imagine you think Jamari. Who's number two? Who's that's number two that's receiver? what that's what I was going to propose back to you guys. Is who do you all have going? Uh, assuming you all have Jamari leading the team in touchdowns mm-hmm. and yards. Who would you all have being the number two in touchdowns? Number two in touchdowns, I think it's going to be a tight end. Um, and I think, I think it be, could, I think it could be Kevin Coleman because he's it, he's looked good. really good. He's looked really good in the spring. He's looked really good in the fall. Now, I mean, it, it could be, uh, it could be Chris Bell because he's also looked really good. And plus, he he might get more roles as like a like a hybrid wide receiver tight end. But I mean, Kevin Coleman has looked really good. I, See, I, I think, think good. I, I really think that Chris Bell could be the number two in maybe yards and touchdowns, especially after what you're hearing, what I'm hearing from you, Matt, with him being slid into that, you know, slot tight end position. Uh, a red zone threat at 6'2", 225. I mean, a 225-pound receiver, you just say, you know, throw the ball up to him and go get it. Go make, go make a play. Big guy, right? Right, yeah. Sat? <laughs> he's he's yeah. the big guy. Yeah. That's the big guy right there, right? Yeah, the red zone is an interesting – another nuance. It's going to just be really interesting to see how they attack. You know, is it fades? Is it, you know, the, the post? Is it You might see plants? some completed fades. Like, we I'm, haven't even, like, oh, with Lamar. Backfield, like, fade, man. Lamar There's didn't have very people. many where we even did that, like, back then. Yeah. I, I think of the play against uh, UNC Charlotte where he hit quick in the back of the end zone. But even then, that was – Beautiful. Yeah, I mean, like, that was one of the best passes I think I've ever seen that. All right, in that stadium. Let's speed through this a little bit. Tackler, I've got TJ Quinn. I think that when you look at the linebacker position and how they attack, I mean, I, I think there's going to be a lot of guys that play there. We've talked a lot about Stan Quan Clark and Keith Brown. I think Jackson Hamilton's going to play some. I think you're going to see Jalen Alderman, Jack Ryger out there. There's a there's a number of guys who lead the team could lead the team in tackles. Maybe Ben Perry, uh, but I'm going to go with TJ Quinn just because of the way that this defense is going to be, you know, kind of playing and, and how they'll ultimately kind of attack the football. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it's Ben Perry or, you know, maybe a Gilbert Friars and whoever slides into that role and is the, you know, the kind of the go-to guy out there playing two or three downs of possession uh, or, you know, within a four down um, drive. So uh, I like TJ Quinn. I think he's going to have a big season. Uh, and Matt, I said it way before you and you just need to get over it. <laughs> I'm, all right. I'm breaking up the <laughs> TJ Quinn love and I'm going with MJ. You, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I think that he is a dude that knows how to find the ball uh, obviously he's not afraid to go up and make a hit. Uh, predicting him to be the leader, the captain of the defense. I just, you know, a guy like that, you know, it, it might sound stupid because, you know, you're thinking, oh, well, safety's leading the team in tackles. They must have a bad run game or something like that or bad run defense. And no, that's not what I'm saying at all. I just think that, you know, he could be utilized more in the box. And I think he's just going to find the ball. Certain players have a way yeah. of just finding their way to the football and he's mine. Yeah, and it's not a bad pick because I actually looked at it right before the show. I'm almost certain that in 21, Purdue's leading tackler was a safety. I'm Look at me. certain that it was. Look at me over here. I told everybody, start of the show, bet Vince's predictions. Just do it. <laughs> Blindly trust the man. Yeah, it's going to be, you know, there's just a lot more guys who um, could potentially lead the team in tackles. I mean, obviously, the last couple of years, we've seen some of the same guys at the top each year. Um, so this year it's going to be a little bit of a different and it'll be a committee. I mean, you're not going to see somebody with, you know, probably more than 70 tackles 
we've had local players go over, I think, 100 a couple of years and the uh, last couple of years. Yeah. So um, definitely there. What about – go ahead, Matt. See, see I, for my leading tackler, you mentioned Ben Perry. I think it is going to be Ben Perry. And that's partially because he's already a good – we know he's a good player. He's a very good sound tackler. And, and just because of the position he's going to be playing, which is that star position, he's going to be all over the damn field. He's going to be – uh, sitting in zone, he's going to be in the slot, in the boundary. He'll be playing deep as a safety at times because that was his position coming up in high school. He'll be playing for he could be playing traditional inside linebacker. He could be playing like some sort of hybrid outside linebacker. I mean, he he has the he can legitimately play almost every position except for defensive tackle. Like he is he is an extremely versatile piece of his defense, and I think because of that versatility it's going to give him more opportunities to be closer to where the action is going to be or where they think the action is going to be. All right. The most prestigious award of them all, the sack King, it, you know, Yasir Abdullah is our first ever winner of that award. Um, and he's going to pass the crown down this year. And, and we might all be in agreement here that it's Ashton Gelati. I mean, that's what I'm going with. I've got eight and a half sacks is the number that I'm going to give him this season. I think it could be double digits. Uh, it wouldn't be I, shocking to me if it was. I think it's, I think it'll be 10 because I mean, he's already, uh, what was returning leading uh, tackle for loss and sack guy. I can't remember what his totals were off the top of my head, but I mean, both in the spring and in the fall, like I said earlier in the show, he's looked damn near unblockable no matter who you put in front of him. Yeah. Uh, I think you guys said it well. <laughs> there we go, for the sake of time, I think we all agree. Uh, we don't need to be on our mad dog and Stephen A. Smith every single time. I mean, best, best hair in college football, too. We can all acknowledge that. That's right. And, and the pictures yeah, from ACC Media Day were just were just fantastic. I yeah, mean, it's that's just, like a head and shoulder, like, like yeah. Ralph Lauren Polo commercial. That's right. Picture. That's right. Makes Matt jealous. We need to get Matt in an Ashton Gelati wig just one time for Media Day. I think that would be the funniest thing you ever. Know, you notice how his beard's all trimmed up and lined up and stuff. You can tell he's been doing fucking. Right. He, looks weak. he doesn't do that shit for us. He's glowing right now. All right. Uh, and then finally, interceptions. What do we think there? I've got uh, a tie between Quincy Riley and MJ Griffin at four picks on the season each. I think Quincy could get five because, I mean, it, even in a, in, I don't want to say limited reps because he, he saw plenty of action. And I mean, but he was like the go to reserve. He wasn't a starter and he led the team in picks with three. And he was, he was already the best cover corner on the team. So now that he's been elevated to a permanent starting role, or at least should be, I think he could get five picks. I'm going bold, and I'm currently praying to Jesus that this pick doesn't bite me in the ass. And I'm going with Jarvis Brownlee. Uh, you know, he's going to break the curse of the twos, not playing very well out there on the field. He kind of reminds me of Trey Clark a lot in the sense where Trey was an extremely aggressive corner who had to kind of be put – in the check had to be, you know, almost put into a bubble of this is what you're going to do. You know, this is kind of how you're going to play and eventually grew into the ball player that he was, you know, as a senior and everything like that. But I, I love physical corners. I love when a corner is not afraid, whether he gets beat or anything like that to, you know, line back up there and press coverage and be able to, you know, give a receiver a one, two again. Uh, so, mm -hmm. but I'm going That's with him. Hope it doesn't bite me in the ass. Well, I think they're all good predictions. I, I don't think we're going to be nearly as wrong as we were last year. I'm pretty sure that I said last year for my bold prediction that I forget who it was that I said was going to run, throw, pass, and – Oh, Mark Schoen, probably. No, I forget who it was. But that was my prediction last year was that somebody oh, on the Braden. roster was going to – Yeah, it might have been Braden Smith. Uh, was going to run. Who's a pilot now? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Hey, man, you know. Everybody's got everybody's got to go pro at something, as they said uh, a long time ago in, in that advertising campaign. But let's jump into bold predictions to end the show here. Kind of alluded to it, so I'll go first. I, I, Matt, I, I totally agree with you that I think Jamari Thrash obviously is going to be the top guy and that he's going to be a big volume guy. But when you look at where he's been at Georgia State, his yards uh, on average per catch, he's a big play guy. He can take some of those plays that Charlie Jones got in that offense and he can, he can, no, no offense to Charlie Jones, right? He's a, he's a gym rat, right? He's sneaky, athletic, <laughs> uh, decisively quick. I think what you get out of Jamari Thrash is an elevated version, assuming that he can play at this level and can have that separation. And I think he can. Um, and, if, and I think they're going to scheme him a lot of the times open, but I am going Jamari Thrash is going to have over 1300 yards on the season, he's going to have 89 receptions, uh, which I did the math earlier and I did not write it down, but shakes out to a pretty healthy yard per catch. And I, I know that's 
that's really, really lofty. But you got to think when you look at the volume of which Louisville throws, the, of which Jeperon throws the football, yes, they're going to run more this year. Yes, they're going to dump the ball down. But what they don't have that they've had in years past is that tight end, that go-to tight end who demands a lot of the catches. They're going to spread the sugar, of course. Jack Plummer's got weapons up and down all over that offense um, from the running backs to the wide receivers. And of course there's going to be a number of guys, but I just think that when you look at how Jeff Brown runs that offense of that number one receiver, the importance of what they bring to the team and the versatility that he gets, it's, it's, it's Charlie Jones combined with Rondell Moore combined with Greg Bell in a sense, and just the, what a Jamari thrash is. Uh, so I think Jamari thrash is going to have breakout season. I think he's going to be all ACC first team, potentially not necessarily a first team all American, but a guy who's in, an honorable mention kind of deal, but I think he's going to have a breakout season and put himself on draft radars next year. Well, if, if he has a 1,300 yard season, he better be a first team American. Uh, sure, sure, man. I mean, no, no doubt. We'd still get hosed by Clemson, some freaking ACC BS. I would not put that past. I mean, after the Wake Forest game, what, two years ago with the clock and everything? I mean, you just can't trust no. North Carolina. You no, just can't. You no. can't. All right, Matt, what do you got, man? So my um, – I've got two. I've got one on offense, one on defense. The one on defense is a little bit more realistic, the one on offense a little more on the bold side. But my bold offensive prediction is that Jack Plummer will be the the second coming of Kenny Pickett. And I say that because the first four years of Kenny Pickett's career, especially like the last two heading into his senior season, he was good – not great, not terrible, but good. I mean, you could see the potential, but, I mean, he didn't really have the, the career body of work. And then his final year at Pitt, he exploded. I think, well, I was looking at Kenny Pickett's career stats, and I think he had more touchdowns thrown in his senior season than he had in his previous four years combined. Like, it was <laughs> – it was insane. I, I I don't I'm not saying that Ken, that Jack Palmer's going to go out there and win ACC Player of the Year like Kenny did that year because I mean there's plenty of other good quarterbacks in the ACC, but I think Jack Plummer's career arc like because yeah, like the narrative around Jack Plummer has been okay yeah he, we can see the tools but I mean like he he got benched at Purdue a couple times and at Cal they didn't win so like there's not really like a, a lot of positive like career narratives surrounding Plummer but I can see him just skyrocketing for his final year in college. So that's what that's my offensive bull prediction. My defensive bull prediction is one I actually believe, and I would not be one bit shocked that it'll happen, is that Louisville leads the ACC in picks. Because, I mean, they were second in the ACC last year, second only to NC State. Now, NC State's got a lot of good cornerbacks and safeties too, but Louisville is already deep, and they've, they've only gotten deeper with some of their transfer portal acquisitions. And I think Jarvis is going to uh, turn some of those PBUs he had last year's in the pick, in the picks. Uh, Quincy Riley, now that he's in a permanent starter role, uh, he's going to turn – he's going to have a lot more opportunities to put on display his cover abilities. And then, like, some of those other guys, like in the secondary, like MJ Griffin, I mean, he's someone who can – realistically get four interceptions i mean and you've, you've got plenty of guys back there who who have the capability to track the ball down so i i can easily see louisville leading the acc in interceptions maybe like 18 or 19 i'm going to go with for a defensive bowl prediction i'm going to say that ashton gelati is going to break the single season sack record I just think that he is a very explosive player. I think this is going to be his year. Yeah, size, everything that you've seen from him is just positive, positive, positive. Uh, and you finally get him in more of a true pass rushing role, and I'm you know excited to see that. Offensively, are y'all ready for this one? I'm ready. Josh right Lipson leads the team in touchdowns. Can you tell he has a walk-on bias? He said earlier that he was going to criticize as a walk-on. Look, but now look at Jeff him. loves tight ends. Loves tight ends. Who had three receiving touchdowns in the spring game, Matt? Answer. No one, because he had two. All right, whatever. <laughs> I, you don't need to be right. <laughs> <anymore>. <laughs> and I didn't drink any beer that game. I swear. None. Uh-huh. <laughs> sure. Sure. <laughs> You have Rose up yelling football at you the whole time. Yes. But um, I do think Josh has the potential to lead the team in touchdowns solely off of, you know, how Jeff utilizes the tight end, red zone capability, and, you know, Josh is good at doing his job and catching the football. I mean, 
have you ever seen lifts and drop pass? So like what you're saying is at the end of the season, we're going to be asking Ian Pfeiffer who? Yeah, we'll be saying Josh See, Lifton. That's the thing. I mean, they don't have like a real proven go-to commodity in tight end, though. That's the, th- that's the thing. Like, well, I mean, Lifton. They couldn't support Vince's watch, argument, you know. Watch. I mean, you just never know. See, that's a bold prediction, Matt. There's no reasoning with a bold prediction, Matt. Yeah, yeah that's true. I don't know why I'm why I'm trying to. That's right. Yeah, that's sounds right. like you're hating on my bold prediction, Matt. <laughs> it sounds like you're hating. I mean, I just <laughs> said Jack Moore is going to be Kenny Pickett. Duke is going to be good so at anything be. other than basketball and lacrosse. That's bold. That I is bold. hope I hope Duke goes undefeated heading into that game, just so I can rub your face in it. I, I will not watch a single Louisville football game next season. Or the following season, if Duke goes undefeated, book it right now. I won't watch a single down. Can you imagine if Duke made it to the college football playoff? Like what that would do? I won't watch. <laughs> I, mean, I won't watch. And here we go. We've got Duke and Alabama in yeah. game one. No. And at the end of it, it's like an Alabama sixty-nine, Duke seven. Yeah. I mean, they, they, <laughs> yeah. they won't even have a famous like Duke football player to bring out there at, at, at like to do the coin flip. You know how they, they, they Daniel, they Daniel, have, like, Daniel Jones. <laughs> Like here's Jason Tatum. He's made it to the Eastern Conference Finals and the NBA Finals and lost. <laughs> That's going to wrap us up here from the Pink Seeds Podcast. We've got a ton of great episodes coming in the next couple of weeks. Some great guests coming down the road. So be sure to subscribe to the pod at Pink Seeds Pod on Twitter, is where you can find us at Matt underscore at Matt McGavick. I'm, I haven't done this in a while. Get General right underscore Wasp. Yeah, no, Matt, un- Matt underscore McGavin. You can find the site at U of L report. There you go. At Matt McGavin's chili. That's with an H. If you want to find that account on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, at Vince of the Coco, at Jacob Lane 08. And of course, follow us on YouTube as well. You can listen to the show there each week. And all the episodes this off season of where are they now? 10 of those out. Just tons of great content this off season. So be sure to check all that out. We will be back next week previewing the season as we get one week closer uh, to Louisville football on uh, September 1st in Atlanta, Georgia, against the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets. Uh, and until then, fellas, any closing thoughts? Anything you want to say? Matt, any, any big famous radio guy, you got any more radio interviews coming this week? Or uh, TV shows? What are we, what, a documentary on the Matt McGavick? What do we got? Instead, Matt? Hell no. I'm actually going to miss the last two open practices of fall camp because I'm going to New Jersey for a couple of days. There you go. Matt McGavick getting a break. Shock, That's shock. You're not going to watch Duke's open practice. Matt's driving him to watch Duke. All right, that is going to wrap us up here. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. We will catch you next week.